But I have to say, uh, I don't watch too much Ring of Honor, but on your suggestion, <laughs> on your recommendation, I did watch the Briscoe versus Briscoe, what do you call it? Chicken match? Chicken the fight on a farm. Well, that's what it is. And I watched it. I'm assuming you did as well. I did as well. And we talked about it. And before I, we talked about that we were going to watch it and I did watch it. I want you to just briefly, before I go into anything, just give me your first blush and then we can talk. But did you give it a thumbs up or a thumbs down? I gave it a thumbs up. But let me just say, once again, I'm not crazy about the style of matches. I don't even know if you call it that. These, I mean, it's a cinematic match, but I thought they it did it better. This wasn't even cinematic. What about an on-location match to call this? On-location match. They did this better than everyone else has done it, although I'm not crazy about the concept. But they did it really well. I'll say that the Briscoes are great. Every time I see them, I, rem I remember <laughs> how great they are. But the father, I haven't seen too much of the father. That guy should go to Hollywood. That guy's ready for some roles as like a Cajun villain or something. He could make a fucking fortune doing something. He's a perfect, he's a fantastic wrestling gimmick. All of them are because they're real. We're going to talk about it. And I just wanted you to give that because I didn't want to sit here and put this thing over and then have everybody say, well, Brian's just going to agree with him. And then no, you no, agree no. with me. I'm not a big fan of. Whether Before you want to call them cinematic, anything. whether you want to call them cinematic matches or whatever, I'm not a big fan of these location matches. Yeah. But this was not done in any way to be insulting. It actually made sense to further the story. You know, I saw the video package early on. The father yeah. saying, "You guys got to get back. You got to do this. You have to fight each other." So again, not crazy about the overall concept, but the best I've seen anyone do it. And folks, as, as we uh, continue putting this thing over, you can go to ROHwrestling.com, I assume right now. I don't know if you're hearing this in three months, you might have to look. <clears throat> but it's the most recent episode of the television. If you didn't see it over the weekend, you can go to the website and you can watch this thing. Here's the deal. We've talked before a number of times about when you have the difference between when you have a match that needs a stadium or a stadium that needs a match. Carrie and Flair in Dallas after David died, they, that was a match that needed a stadium. There was no place indoors that they could hold the amount of people that would buy tickets to see it. The Great American Bash in Charlotte in 85 and 86, you, there was no place indoors you could get that many people. Certain matches, certain events have, need a stadium, and but then, as we saw with a few successive David Von Erich memorial tributes in Texas when they try to do it every year or they try to just do it and say well we're going to rent the stadium and we're going to have a show that's when you have a stadium that needs a match if there had been no cinematic matches this thus far to this point it would be great because this was a situation where they actually had a call for one if that makes any sense this was not just, oh, we're going to find a fucking place outside and we're going to dress it like a graveyard and we're going to have a movie set and a movie shoot or we're going to go to a fucking football field just because our billionaire owner owns it even though nobody on this field's ever played football in their fucking life or whatever, and just shoehorning or but just because a, just because somebody's a dentist, we're going to have a fight in a fucking dentist's office. And just the visual being corny and stupid and silly. The reason why I've always liked the Briscoes is because they are real. They're not real in terms of, no, everything they do in a wrestling ring is not real. But they're real in terms of their gimmicks are not far-fetched. They're them. And the reason why... Jay calls Mark chicken. Not because he's a coward. But because since he was the younger brother, he was the one that had to fucking shovel the dead chickens out of the chicken coop. They're brothers. They've been, it, it's not a wrestling thing. He's called him chicken before the wrestling. They are on their farm with their father. None of this shit was dressed as a movie set was set. They put stuff in the that would be there anyway in place to reach it. But it, it the whole premise of this was the Briscoe brothers, even though they've been the greatest tag team in the world for all this time in Ring of Honor, every once in a while, they have a match 
Every once in a while, they get grumpy with each other. They fought all their life and competed all their life on the farm and in sports and et cetera. They showed the pictures in the package. Um, it's true life shit that they just draw on. And after the 500th episode where they had one, I think they've had two or three matches while they've been in Ring of Honor. After their 500th episode uh, where they had a match and and I think Jay won or there was it was a count out the point is there's still the rivalry mark said he didn't want me to get the victory he didn't want me to get the pinfall whatever the case and papa briscoe who as you said is like the johnny cash of wrestling with that voice and the way he delivers lines and also he's he's 40 or 50 pounds bigger than either mark or jay he's the goddamn most impressive physical specimen in the family it's almost like the fucking redneck Delaware version of the Armstrongs. Hey, can I ask you a question? Yeah. Because you obviously worked with them a long time, even before you booked Ring of Honor or were involved behind the scenes in Ring of Honor. You did shots for them, so you were around them a long time. When did you first hear about or meet the father? Um, It wasn't until the second run. I, I managed them a couple of times in 2004 or 5-ish when Gabe had asked me to come in. And just make some shots. And to be honest, they were, what, 18, 19 years old? I've said they were puppies with big paws. They were doing a lot of shit. A lot of it didn't look very good. They were, you know, they were just eager. But then the second time, from 2009 to 2012, they had grown up. And they'd gotten older and better and polished their shit. And they could talk. And they just didn't look so young and inexperienced. And that's when... um were you there at the show with the, we were in the Manhattan Center or the Hammerstein, one or the other, where Papa Briscoe had a six man with them. Papa Briscoe, Mark and Jay against the Kings of Wrestling and Shane Hagedorn, their manager. So it was Chris Hero and Claudio Cesaro. I don't think I was there for that one, no. That was one of my favorite matches because the New York fans were, it was classic wrestling. Take the babyface team and a member of their family, in this case, their father, and we did an angle on TV to explain all of this, where Papa Briscoe slapped the piss out of fucking Shane Hag. No, it was Chris Hero, I think, he slapped. But anyway, against the heel team and their manager in a six-man, and the New York fans wanted to hate this, and they wanted to hoot at it because it was too wrestling, and Papa Briscoe got in there, and not only kept up his end, but did a flying clothesline off the top rope, and we did some tag team stuff, and the Hero and Claudio were such an incredible heel team that they ended up giving an ovation, the fans did, to Papa Briscoe. And they, the people loved the fucking match. And and then he was surprised. We tried to pay him, and he didn't want to take it. And they had driven the, the RV, the Winnebago, the Briscoe Mobile, up from Sandy Fork to New York as the whole family came up. I said, here, there's a few hundred dollars. What take the family out to dinner in New York, for God's sake. Um, but he's just he's he understands wrestling because they obviously he was a fan. He watched wrestling, and that's what the Mark and Jay watched it when they grew up, so they knew what wrestling was and how to think about it. But he's also just an incredible personality. And that voice and the fact that he's like all the Briscoes, especially Jay, when he cuts a promo on you and swears that he's going to commit some kind of mayhem, you believe it. You believe him on television, looking in those eyes. And they never sound like the shit's been written for him. They always sound natural. Even if, even if you know wrestling's a work and what they're saying is a hype to hype the fight, it sounds like they came up with it, and it's good. <clears throat> the package that where they set the rivalry up was brilliant because it was real. And Mark Briscoe can be silly without being silly because he's not trying to be silly. It's There's a little element of some deliverance in this gimmick, but it works, and it's believable. And but anyway, the, the this was not as I said. I I don't want to call it cinematic <clears throat> because they had what two handheld cameras following them around, and this fight was done in except for one thing that I'll mention here in a second was done in believable real time, where there there were no obvious edits 
Uh, there was a couple commercial breaks because this was television, but no commentary. There was no commentary. There was no spooky music over it. It was two handheld cameras shooting these guys having a fucking fight. <clears throat> and the way they got into it, just the first scene set to stage. You're inside a, a, a dark area and a garage door opens up and you see Papa Briscoe's face there and he just goes and walks in and there the Briscoes walk in and this is the shed on their farm that they legitimately have this shitty ass ring set up on set up in and it's yeah, by the way tighten those years. ropes tighten those ropes somewhere well the, but this it's just it's been there for 20 years and the thing can you imagine the smell in there and the mildew because there's a dirt floor there was old spare tires underneath the ring and it's not like they dressed it for this occasion you can tell some of this shit's been there 15 years right that's what made it this is really their place and what they have there. And Papa Briscoe sounded like a, a Denver Pyle as Briscoe Darlin. He starts it out. He's not even the referee. He's just the observer. But he starts it out. All right, boys, keep it clean and fight like men. Let's do this. And then he backs out and they start a fight. And in this shitty ring, they got in their fucking shed. And all that stuff leaning on the walls. They fucking fight out on the dirt floor. Uh, they didn't go crazy with sledgehammers and shots with ridiculous implements that nobody could live through. Jay swung a shovel that he grabbed off the wall and Mark ducked it. And Papa Briscoe said, get back in the ring. And every, if they would go too far or try to go too far, they would have a legitimate reason. Either somebody ducked something before it landed or Papa Briscoe just, hey, um, there was a table set up there with tools all over it and fucking six months of fucking sawdust or whatever. And Mark goes to moonsault Jay and Jay pushes him off and he flips through that table. But it was, it, it should have been there. It's a fucking shed. They go out the side door into the yard, the kicks and the punches and the trash talk and the grunts and the weird noises that the Briscoes make. The weird noises. Let me stop you right now. That took me by surprise. Just the whole, every time he would go to punch his brother, you hear, yeah. <laughs> well, it's Mark especially, but it goes back to the old days. And remember, we've talked about this, a Harley race who learned from a guy like wild Bill Longs and all the, the constant chatter, the, the grunts. So when they're calling a the one tackle, you can't really drop down and drop kick. Yeah. But they take it to, but yeah, you can hear Mark. Sometimes when he does that froggy bow, the not the frog splash, but the frog elbow, he'll shriek. You can hear it through the fucking arena. It'll pierce your fucking ears. They're just they're they're fucking crazy. Um, they 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 fight to the pickup truck. There's a garbage can lid and a wash tub in the back of an old pickup truck sitting there next to the Briscoes camper that is legitimately. When they travel to shows very far away, they load the family up and they drive this fucking camper. They brought it to the Manhattan Center. Uh, that, like I said, that weekend of the Six Man, and then we even had I don't I left I don't know if they ever put it out or put it on TV, but we had uh the the television crew, a couple of the camera people and and the producer, a few other people follow them or not follow them, but actually in the camper with the Briscoes for a weekend to shoot on the road with the Briscoes. Cause it's just, it's a fucking traveling caravan thing. Anyway. And then Jay and they're Jay's trash talk. I got you now chicken. And it's, you know, he, did you notice when he pulled a sheet of plywood out of the pickup truck, it wasn't brand new from Home Depot. It was an old weathered fucking stained up old piece of plywood that should come out of the back of a pickup truck. This is just this, just this attention to detail. And then Mark, to get, to get free from Jay's oppression, hits him with a nut shot. And Papa Briscoe, as they did put in a shot of Papa, Papa Briscoe going, hey, now, like, hey, keep it clean. Fight like men. But they, basically, Mark suplexes 
Jay threw the sheet of plywood, leaned off the back of the pickup truck, and Jay sold it like he had internal injuries. It wasn't this just constant. You you felt like you could feel them hitting each other because I mean it's not like th their work is honest to God is a little bit stiff to begin with, and then when they're working with each other, I'm surprised they weren't marked up worse than they were because I've seen them just do shit with each other in the ring and come up with black eyes and bloody mouths. And then when Mark, if there's a ladder laying next to the Winnebago, Mark leans it up on the Winnebago and climbs the ladder and he's going, you know, I'm crazy. Act like you don't know I'm crazy. It's them. So that, that was one of my favorite spart, sp sparts, favorite spots is that it's entertainment without being fucking stupid because Mark goes to the top of the camper and what do we always complain about? Every time somebody dives, there's some fucking idiot waiting to catch him, right? So Mark goes up to the top of the fucking Winnebago and Jay gets up to his feet and moves up and says, now what you going to do, dumbass? And Mark says, I'm about to jump on your ass. What about, come up here. Are you scared? All right, motherfucker. And uh, just enough bleeps to make things worse. <laughs> so Jay climbs the ladder, gets up on the can. They have the big one, two on the roof of the camper. And that's the only place. I don't know if you noticed it, but I saw an awkward cut and it still could be explained. But if I'd been in post, I would have just, I would have cleaned this up. They've had the floor shot or the handheld shot from the ground for a while while they're fighting on top of the Winnebago. And then suddenly Mark gets a rear naked choke on Jay and they cut to another camera that's already on the roof of the camper right up on him. And that was, a, and I even had to go back and watch it. And a case could be made because the shot that they had, the other cameraman could have actually gotten up on the top of the camper and we wouldn't have seen him because you're trying not to see the camera people. That's television. But it was a little abrupt. Did you notice it? Where they were just there. I noticed it, yes. <clears throat> I would have preferred to see, and part of this might be, I'm trying to I'm trying to visualize this poor cameraman. Cause the only way up there legitimately was that fucking ladder. I'm trying to visualize the cameraman carrying a goddamn twenty thousand dollar camera and climbing that leaned up ladder on top of a Winnebago. But I'd like to have seen the camera slowly peek over the edge at the top of the ladder and come in that way. But anyway. Um, then Jay threw Mark off the top of the camper onto a canvas covering something, probably boxes, but we didn't see them. That was the only part I really didn't like, just because to be consistent, what did he throw them on? It was just stuff. There had to be something. It just was too convenient that that was there. I, I I get where you're coming from, but at least we didn't see the shit pop out from underneath the 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 and I say canvas a tarpaulin. Yeah, what yeah, we're yeah. trying to, you know. But you have those on farms, leaned up next to the lean twos, whatever the fuck. But I'll go with that. Anyway, he took a bump. Here's what I didn't like about it, and it was out of Ring of Honor Wrestling's control. They're doing all this violent shit every. 90 seconds they have to flash up the constant warning do not try this at home this is experienced professional you could be killed or whatever because sinclair's goddamn nervous somebody's going to get thrown off the roof of the chicken coop but anyway after he got thrown off the roof of the winnebago mark sold big again and jay grabs him and drags him to the truck and throws him in the back of the truck tells the cameraman get in with me and they get in the truck and he drives off to throw him in the fucking chicken shit, in the compost shed. And the actual and this is what I liked about it because the actual drive time to where they were going was 30 seconds. <laughs> and so it wasn't like a cut. He just drove him down to the fucking compost shed and Jay gets out and Mark's out of the back of the truck. Well, obviously, because we haven't seen him for 30 seconds and he didn't even slam the fucking tailgate. But then Mark dives back in and makes a big comeback, making some more of his deranged fucking noises and chokes him with a bull rope that's laying there. And then one other thing, this was a funny line, but he delivered it well. Mark pulls a fucking table 
out of the back of the pickup truck. It goes, how convenient. <laughs> Which, of course, they had to take a little wink and a nod at it. Uh, he crowned Jay with a road sign. He put him on the table, used a plastic bucket as a step stool to climb up into a tree to get on the roof of the compost shed. And you know he's been doing that for 20 years. Because how else would he know the exact way to climb that tree? And then he splashes Jay through the table off the top of the roof of the compost shed, and they go to the break. And they say, what are they, fucking dead? And you come back, and they're still laying there without moving. And it was, the, it was so peaceful. They're in the middle of all this wreckage, and they're not moving. And the birds are chirping, cheep, cheep, cheep. You hear the fucking wildlife. And then Papa Briscoe comes over and says, are y'all good yet? Are you done? He helps them both up. They're both selling big. I mean, it takes like a minute or two, but now Papa Briscoe's the fucking center of attention. And he tells him, he said, we got to finish this. Y'all are the greatest tag team in the world. We can't, we got to work this out. And he's dragging them both because he's big enough to do it back into the shed. And he said, get it out of your system. Do what you need to do, right? He gets them back in the shed, rolls them in the ring. And this is where every other cinematic match has to have the big bump and the big fucking finish and the most preposterous thing off the roof of the goddamn whatever or off the roof of the cage, as it may be. Instead, he rolls them in the ring in the shed. They stand back up finally. They start slugging each other. Then they start even good-looking forearms, and you can hear Landon, they're potatoing each other, down to their knees. <laughs> And then finally, Mark staggers back and comes with a big clothesline, and both of them go down. And Papa Briscoe looks at him and says, are you good yet? And they both go, we're good. That was the finish, a big clothesline. It was all they had. Nobody won. They just beat the shit out of each other. And then Papa Briscoe says, that's it. About time. Get back to business, being the best damn tag team in the world. But first." clean this shit up and he walks off and leaves him laying there and that's it it's a it was fucking brilliant it was fucking brilliant no spooky music no commentary no jokes being told out of context only funny things that are funny in the organic way that these two fucking maniacs say shit no ridiculous stunts that they couldn't recover from. Nobody got their head caved in with a shovel. Nobody was buried alive by a, a steamroller. No, it, it was their property, their vehicles. It's really their family. There was nothing set up for this past, we're going to bring cameras and do this here on our farm. And that's the, the best part about it. If you... <laughs> This is as close to legitimate as you can possibly make something like this. That's why I liked it. What else do you think? I thought it was really good. I mentioned the one spot I didn't like and the reason why, but they're captivating. I just wish, you know, because I saw some of the other parts of the show and it's still an empty arena and it's still dark and I'm not trying to take anything away because when we watched them during the pandemic, Ring of Honor did one of the better jobs of any promotion out there. Yeah. But I don't know. I'd like to see something really compelling with the Briscoes now. Like, I'd love to come back and see them in a good feud with someone now. I'm like, in, I'm invested and interested now. Let's see what happens. And I'm not sure when they're getting people back in the buildings, but I assume it's going to be, they probably taped well in advance, but it's going to be sometime upcoming in summer or fall. And that's a, the reason why they did such a good job in the pandemic is because they were they were selling athletic contests, especially that's when they had the pure wrestling tournament and and the pure rules matches. They were prom prominently featured because you can't work Gaga in an empty building, and unfortunately, you know, a lot of the other promotions learned that the hard way. But you can uh, uh, the WWF should have been the first one to learn when Charlotte and Ripley had the match at WrestleMania because they were the only ones that just concentrated on let's make them feel this since since there's nobody here. But athletic contests and the announcing, Caprice Coleman and Ian Riccoboni, um, 
were the most legitimate sports-like announced team because they were calling something that wasn't preposterous and, and especially in front of an empty building. So they just, they try to close up the loopholes in the logic. They're not going for entertainment for the sake of entertainment, for but for you to be entertained by the product without prostituting it, which is what you're supposed to do for any kind of long-term success anyway. So I, I, anyway, if anybody wants to know, will Cornette like a cinematic match? Well, this is the one I like. So if you want to watch it and yell at me, feel free, go ahead. I don't care. Well, you don't care about that, but do you care about manscaping? I'll tell you what, Brian, have you ever drawn a string of barbed wire across your crotch? Have you ever no. in, encircled your ball sack in thumbtacks? No. Well, I'll tell you what, that's what it was like for so many years for so many of us trying to keep the crops trimmed, trying to keep the undergrowth from taking over. It was nicking and cutting and cutting and nicking. And all of those things are horrible, but especially when you're doing it around Mr. Johnson and the twins. So with Manscaped, they have taken these precarious and jeopardizing positions and smoothed them out. And right now, have we talked about this? A new product. We've talked about many times the Lawnmower 3.0 and then the new Lawnmower 4.0. But right now, the ultra smooth package, the specialized groin shaving kit to help you buff, protect, and smooth your most precious areas. The crop shaver, the crop exfoliator, and the crop gel all help out. The crop exfoliator is infused with ingredients that can soothe, clear, and keep the skin on and around your pubic area feeling refreshed, reduces the risk of ingrown hairs. The crop gel is a unique clear shaving gel just for the groin because you do not want to obfuscate and obscure your vision when you've got sharp implements in that area. And the crop shaver, designed for shaving the groinal area with confidence. And you always need confidence when you're dealing with your groinal area. Three precision blades, including extra-wide lubricating strips. Because for one thing, you want to make sure that things are slicker than come on a gold tooth down there when you're shaving. And it's also got the pivoting head. And all the Cult of Coordinat members are fans of pivoting head. So, folks, right now you know what you got to do and what you got to get. The Ultra Smooth Package from Manscaped. Go to manscaped.com slash JCE to get 20% off and free shipping. 20% off and free shipping on the Ultra Smooth Package at manscaped.com slash jce smooth it out fellas